Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, one acculturation strategy is that people need to participate in the larger society of their host culture. Usually that's the way it is. People move to the United States from someplace else and uh, they have to be part of our culture. They have to at least do something with our culture, uh, with the culture in the United States. Um, once upon a time we were getting a lot of immigrants coming in through New York City uh, and what they were doing, they were moving, they were uh, coming to the United States, they were uh, being allowed to stay in the United States, and then they were moving to communities where um, there were other people like them, people that were Greek, or people that were Italian, or people that were, were uh, uh, German, or whatever. They were living in commun communities that were very similar to, to them. Uh, so people were actually not changing their culture. Uh, are the people motivated to acquire an identity consistent with that of the host culture? That's the question. Uh, of course, this is one of the questions that we had. Well, you know, we can talk about what happened to you guys. Uh, we can talk about it all day long, and I'm sure you've already talked ad nauseum about uh, uh, what the boarding schools did to the uh, native populations in the United States. But the reality is, and, and this is, I know this is an excuse, but one of the realities is that they didn't really understand who you guys were. They didn't really have a clue. Most of the people that were running the United States lived on the East Coast. Well, all, almost all the natives were either killed off or driven west on the, from the East Coast uh, in the beginning of the, of the 19th century. So they had no clue. They didn't know who you guys were, but they were getting a lot of immigrants coming in. So all of the... Um, examples that they had were of immigrants and they knew how to treat immigrants they knew how to make immigrants into US citizens so when the question came up how are we going to make all of these these uh, uh, native tribes they had two choices they actually had two choices and they decided that they would uh, try to assimilate you the same way they're they were assimilating the immigrants and that's one of the reasons why they opened the boarding schools now remember, the boarding schools didn't open until the 1870s. First boarding schools in 1875. The Indian Wars didn't end until 1890. So they were, they were trying to educate. They had two choices. Remember, they had two choices. One of them was to try to kill everybody off, to try to kill all the natives off. They could have done that. But there were enough people back east going, oh, no, no, look at the wonderful, these are the wonderful red men. They referred to you guys as red men. I don't know where the word came from, or the concept came from. But of course, they, when they were talking about black people, they were talking about African Americans. When they were talking about brown people, they were talking about people with darker complexions, swarthy complexions. So they, what were they going to call Native Americans? Well, since we're using colors here, they decided to refer to you guys as, as red, red people. And, uh, for one reason or another. Of course, this is an old term, came out of the 17th century. So they had a choice. They had a choice to either try to exterminate all the uh, native people in the United States or try to assimilate them. And they chose assimilation. And that was the more liberal thing to do at that time. As it turned out, it didn't turn out well for, for anybody. But of course, it would have turned out worse if they tried to kill everybody else. Remember, we, uh, the people in the United States, the United, U.S. government comes out of an English uh, ancestry. And if we look at what the English did in other parts of the world, they tried to kill off the entire population uh, of the indigenous peoples. That's what they did in Australia. They were poisoning people. They were shooting them on sight. Uh, they were poisoning water. Uh, they were trying to do, they were, they were attempting genocide out there. And so English-minded people, people with, with these ideas, you know, they, this was the best that they could do. I have a, my ancestors were members of a club called the Red Men Club. And the Red Men Club actually were one of the groups that pushed to assimilate the, the natives. And the reason they did that was because they didn't want to see all the Indians die off. They didn't want to see them killed. And, and they got close. At, at, at the turn of the 20th century, there were only about 100,000 uh, American Indians left in the United States. About 100,000. I know. 
So there were groups that supported uh, protecting uh, what uh, natives were, were left, and one of that groups were, were called the Red Men, as insulting as that is. So if you wander around the United States, you had all of these mascots that had to do with Native Americans. The, the Red Men, uh, the Warriors, the, you know, the, uh, the Indians. Um, I, I used to go to a school called, Mid, called Midwestern State in Wichita Falls, Texas. And they were the Midwestern State Indians. And now they've changed their name to the Mustangs, of course. But at one point, they were the Indians. And it wasn't, they didn't, they didn't adopt these mascots to insult American Indians. Sometimes, of course, it turned into a, a caricature like the Cleveland Indians. But uh, it, was, it was to protect. I mean, the idea was to, to honor and protect. That was the idea. Of course, everything changes in time. Uh, so we can look at these things in a lot of different ways. But, of course, that was one of the, the, the ways that, uh, that people were able to survive. And, of course, the, the, uh, uh, the day people that lived in this part of the world, there's a reason why you guys were able to maintain your culture and why you were able to maintain your traditions. And the reason was because you were so isolated from anything that anybody wanted that they left you alone. That was a good thing. I think. <laughs> but you were able to maintain your culture because nobody, nobody harassed you. Uh, they were trying to take your land. Why would anybody want Shinley? <laughs> It's so, it's dirt, okay? There's no grass, there's nothing green there. What, what is it to want in Chinle? You know, why would want, anybody want a desert? So they left you alone, which is a good thing. And you live in, in a part of the country that, uh, uh, where you're, you were able to maintain yourselves, but at the same time, you didn't have to worry about crazy white people coming in, wanting to plant wheat or something, something stupid. There, were, there are nice areas, of course. This is one of the nice areas. Evidently, wheat fields, and that was, yeah, wheat fields right over there. They were able to grow wheat out there, so can't argue with that. Luckily, there weren't that many white people that had a, had a clue as to the nice areas of the, of the reservation. You think I'm kidding? <laughs> oh, man. And that's what happened up north, of course. Uh, you know, in Montana, it's so damn cold up there that uh, most of the, um, uh, they left the Indians alone because, you know, they were, they were living someplace that nobody wanted. No white people wanted anyway. Okay, so what are we doing? Are the people motivated to acquire identity consistent with that of the host culture? Are these people striving to maintain their own heritage culture and, and, and identity as members of that culture? Uh, I'm not trying to exonerate what happened, okay? I'm just trying to give you a historical, a little bit of a historical perspective, okay? Because there were, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was uh, under the Department of War. So they were, these were people that were geared at killing people, or fighting people, or destroying people, or at least defending the United States. So the Bureau of Indian Affairs was under the Department of War. So it, it took a movement of, of individuals, of ladies marching in the street, uh, for them to change their policies. Because as far as soldiers are concerned, the easiest way to handle a situation is to eliminate that situation, right? All good soldiers know that if you've got an enemy, the best way to uh, not have to fight that enemy is to eliminate that enemy. Yeah, okay. Or neutralize them in one way or another. And that's what they did. They neutralized, here I'm talking history. I've been talking to Marius too much. It's his fault. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, and they did. They neutralized the, uh, the native tribes by killing off all the buffalo because that was the, the food source for all the Plains Indians. Not, not the people here specifically. You guys had other food sources, but uh, the, the, the Sioux and the Cheyenne that they were actually in open warfare with. Uh, so they neutralized them by killing off their food source. Uh, do people have positive attitudes toward their heritage culture, and are they actively seeking ways to 
preserve the traditions of their heritage. Can you guys see this okay? Do I need to raise it up a little bit? Would that be better if I raised this thing up? You okay? You okay, Chris? Okay, you're okay. You're the one behind the camera, so. Okay. <laughs> Another strategy of acculturation uh, involves attempts to fully participate in the host culture while at the same time striving to maintain the traditions of one's heritage culture. This is known as integration strategy. You integrate yourself into the host culture. Now, as a military person, one of the things that you do is that you either maintain your culture the way it is, but as you're moving from one uh, posting to the next, you have to decide whether you're going to try to act like the people in that area. You have to try to decide whether you're going to maintain your culture or try to integrate yourself into the, into the host culture. So while I was living in Mississippi, I was under pressure to change my, my culture. When I was living in Texas, I was under pressure to change my culture. And I can tell you that the culture in the culture in Texas ain't the same as anywhere else in the whole world. I almost used the F word. It's not. It really isn't. But there was pressure for me to become a cowboy. I'm from Indiana. We don't do horses and we don't do boots. Okay? We wear clodhoppers, damn it. Okay. But if you live in Texas, they want you to wear cowboy boots. You don't have to wear the hat, but you, they want you to wear cowboy boots for no reason whatsoever. They don't ride horses. When I was in Montana, I found out why those cowboy boots were so damn uncomfortable. Why they have such high heels so that you can lock, you can lock your, your, your boot into the stirrup. Not really lock it, but you, know, you can clamp into the stirrup so you can hold on to the stirrup with your heel. So that's why cowboy boots are so god-awful uncomfortable. I can't wear it. My foot's too wide, so I can't wear cowboy boots. They're too long. Right. Anyway, they've got pointy toes. <laughs> but I didn't want to integrate anyway. I'm from the north. I didn't want to, I didn't want to start treating African Americans poorly when I lived in Mississippi. So I treated them the same as I'd always treated them, like brothers. There was a pressure in Montana for me to dislike natives because they don't treat natives very well in Montana. But of course, I was teaching at a tribal college and it would be silly for me to teach at a tribal college and not like the people that I'm teaching. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But there are some people that try to integrate. There are some people when they went to Japan, they bought kimonos and they dress, the women dress like geisha, as stupid as that sounds. There are men that tried to become part of the Japanese culture. They studied jujitsu. They studied Taekwondo, which is actually a Korean defense uh, means. Um, and I, I, there's two perfect examples. Uh, now I can't think of it. Chuck Norris was in the Air Force and was stationed in Japan. And when he was in Japan, he became, he, he became part of that culture. He tried to become part of that culture. Chuck Norris. And the other one is, uh, what's that idiot's name? The guy Steven Seagal. I'm sorry? Steven Seagal. Steven Seagal. Yeah, same thing. Exactly the same thing. Went to Japan when, when he was in the service, and he tried to integrate himself into the, into the culture. So he became part of, that, of the Japanese culture. And now he has... Of course, he, he, he has gone to different places. He's lived in China, he's lived in Korea, and he's picked up all those defense uh, styles. Steven Seagal is a sheriff someplace now. He's a, he's a police officer. He, he's not an actor anymore, as odd as that seems. But he was a security policeman in the Air Force. But wasn't he here somewhere in Arizona? Is he here now? Is, is, oh, is, uh, is he down in Phoenix? I think he was in Phoenix where he got like some sort of Honorary sheriff, yeah. Sheriff somewhere. But actually, that's what he does now. He's he do, he's not acting anymore. I don't know. It's kind of strange. So the Japanese have their culture. I mean, it would be. Uh, so should I try to integrate myself into your culture? Should I learn Navajo? Should I? Uh, I don't know. Uh, go to ceremonies. Uh, force myself on <clears throat> into ceremonies. Should I do that? 
hmm, only if I'm invited. I have to be invited. Forcing myself on somebody, that's, that doesn't seem right to me. Uh, people using this strategy have positive views toward both their heritage and their host culture. They are seeking the best of both worlds. And this is known as integration strategy. Uh, the strategy that involves little or no effort to participate in the host culture or to maintain the traditions of the heritage culture is known as a marginalization uh, uh, strategy. And this is, uh, unfortunately, this is what happened with a lot of natives that went to boarding schools. Um, they lost their, cult, their, their native culture, uh, but they didn't want to really participate in the white culture at the same time. It was too oppressive, and it really was. The clothes that uh, the white people used to wear, that uh, everybody used to wear, uh, fairly impressive. And these are all natives, of course, uh, wearing uh, white garb. As you can see, who in the world wants to put a, you know, tie their, uh, put a tie on and put that horrible collar on. But here we've got other individuals that have done that, uh, despite the fact they're native. Look how high that collar is, way up here. Strangling. And this is known as mar marginalization. Uh, strategy. People using this strategy have negative views toward both their heritage and their host cultures. This strategy may be something pursued more by people who have grown up in multiple cultures across their childhood. And of course, this, that was what was forced on people uh, in the boarding schools. Now, luckily, uh, most of the people from here went to boarding schools in this area, so they stayed in the area. They didn't transport. They didn't transport you guys to South Dakota. They didn't send you out to California. Uh, to Riverside, California. They didn't send you up to Oregon. Uh, they didn't send you to Albuquerque. Well, some people they went to Santa Fe. But uh, you were fairly close to your own culture. And that was, you were really lucky as far as that's concerned because you were able to maintain your own culture. You didn't have to, mar you didn't have to marginalize yourself. But some people were sent back east. They were sent to Carlisle, for example. Uh, Jim Thorpe was a uh, was from uh, Oklahoma. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think what he was. I, I, I think he was half Sack and Fox. He was half something else. But uh, he was in Oklahoma, and they sent him all the way out to Pennsylvania uh, to go to school. So you can imagine what the culture shock that he went through, living as a native in uh, in the middle of Oklahoma. And uh, actually, he was from uh, Stroud. He was right from, he was from uh, Prague. I'm sorry, he's from Prague. Uh, and Stroud's right up the road. Uh, but he was from that area. And that's where I used to live in Oklahoma. I used to work in uh, Chandler, which is right next to Prague. Uh, but he was from right there. It was really kind of interesting. And it's the Sac and Fox uh, tribal lands are, are, are right there between Stroud and Prague. Anyway, that's where Jim Thorpe was from, and they, they shipped him out to Pennsylvania. Uh, and he lived there for an extended length of time. And he married a lady from there. I know, I can back this thing up. He married a lady uh, at, at Carlisle, and he thought she was native, and it turned out she was just educated. Uh, she was a, uh, her family had moved uh, to a reservation uh, t to teach, and, and she was actually white, uh, but she, uh, he didn't realize she was white. So he married a lady that, was, that he thought was native and she wasn't native, as odd as that may seem. Okay, uh, marginalization. This is uh, some individuals who have grown up in multiple cultures are sometimes termed as third culture kids, and thus will identify themselves as global citizens. And of course, this is what we see in, in military kids because they move around so much. They don't belong in, in Nebraska. They don't belong in Texas. They don't belong in Colorado. They don't belong in New Mexico. They don't know where they belong. And because of that, of course, because they have to change their culture wherever they go, they feel like they are global citizens rather than somebody who, is, who adheres to a select idea. And the reality is if you live only on the reservation, you this is the culture that you adopt, and you don't really understand any other culture. You go to Phoenix, and everybody seems weird. You go to Albuquerque, everybody seems weird. You go to Gallup, and everybody is weird. It's the weirdest place I've ever been, Gallup. Uh, actually, the weirdest place I've ever been was Haver, Montana. It's the weirdest thing in the world. They love Canadians. They're, right, they're like 15 miles from the Canadian border. They love Canadians, but they hate natives. 
Now here's the bizarre part. There's a reservation on, uh, to the west of them, and there's a reservation to the east of them, and they don't like natives. So they treat them really badly. But they love Canadians who are only 15 miles north of them, as stupid as that sounds. So they invite the Canadians to come in, but they give the, the natives a hard time. It's really kind of stupid, since they're right in between two reservations you'd think they'd have a more positive idea of, uh, of the Navy population. But I used to wear a uh, Fort Belknap uh, t-shirt every time I went to, the, to Haver just to harass people. <laughs> Maybe it's my problem. <laughs> Maybe I'm an asshole, and that's why I get into so much trouble. <laughs> but I, they used to give me a hard time. Of course, I'm, I'm a white guy. Why the hell are they giving me a hard time? Because I'm an asshole. But that's what Jeff called me. Isn't that what you said I was? <laughs> Some researchers do not accept marginalization as a legitimate acculturation strategy, but as a form of neuroticism. In other words, you lose this culture, you lose your, your home culture, so you have no culture to adhere to. And of course, they, think, they see that as a form of neuroticism, but the reality is they see themselves as uh, global citizens. And potentially, almost all military people are that way. And they have a difficult time accepting a whatever culture they're in because they have adopted their own way of seeing the world. So they see themselves as global. You know, you've, if you've been overseas, you've been to Germany, you've been to Japan, uh, if you've been to England, you know, you have uh, uh, integrated into a really alien culture. Uh, so you're more likely to see, see things differently. And as we're going to find out at the end of this chapter, if you have lived in more than one place, you're smarter than people who have only lived in one place. Wait until we get there. It's exciting. I know. I'm so excited. That's, that's what makes us so brilliant, Jeff. I we've, call myself brilliant. We've, lived, we've lived in more than one place. The assimilation strategy involves an attempt to fit in and fully participate in the host culture while making little or no effort to maintain the traditions of one's heritage culture. And of course, this is what they were looking for. This is what they were seeking, assimilation. They wanted the native peoples to assimilate. They wanted you guys to be proto-white people. They wanted you to act just like white people. And that's what they were trying to teach you at the boarding schools. They wanted you to assimilate. That's what they did to all the immigrants when they came in. They wanted them all to assimilate. And so they sent them to school, and the, the, uh, the, the education that they got was, was uh, towards citizenship. They were trying to force them to become good citizens of the United States. They didn't care about the parents. Parents were already gone. The parents were already Greek, or the parents were Italian, or whatever. And they would always identify as Greek or Italian. But they could, they could force the, their children that, that went to their public schools, they could force them to assimilate. And that's what they did. They forced them to assimilate. And we're going to talk about this later. Uh, we're going to talk about how uh, some individuals, uh, when they assimilated, uh, that the first generation, the second, actually the second generation immigrants, uh, were more rebellious toward their parents than the third generation immigrants. And the reason they were more rebellious was because uh, they, they are the ones that actually pulled uh, away from the, their culture, their home culture, uh, and they were actually rebelled against the culture of their parents. Third generation are the ones that go back to their grandparents to find out what they're supposed to be like because they feel like they're, they're lost. They feel lost. So they go back to their grandparents to find out what their heritage is supposed to be. This is really kind of fascinating. So if, you're a, if you are a, uh, a second generation immigrant, these individuals are, adhere to the host culture far more than they adhere to, the, uh, uh, to their, their home culture. The odd thing is that when the females assimilate better than males do, and that, this is one of the reasons why we get Terror, uh, male terrorists, but not female terrorists. We very, very rarely get female terrorists. It involves having positive attitudes toward the heritage culture. Uh, it reflects a, a desire to leave behind the ancestral past as to fit in with, so that you will fit in with the uh, host culture. And of course, they're trying to assimilate. They're trying to change themselves to be like, you know, they came to the United States to be Americans. 
and now they want to act like Americans. They don't want to act like Israelis or, or uh, Saudi Arabians or Syrians or whatever. They want to be Americans. The separation strategy involves efforts to maintain the traditions of the heritage culture while making little or no effort to participate in the host culture. And we see this more, far more in male, uh, uh, male immigrants than we do in female immigrants. They try to maintain the host culture. This strategy is composed of positive attitudes toward the heritage culture and negative attitudes toward the host culture. We see females assimilating. We see males not assimilating. And that's because of the se separation strategy. The people pursuing separation strategies do not wish to acculturate to the host culture. They want to maintain their own, their own culture, their old culture. And these males are the ones that become terrorists. And of course, we're having problems with this in select countries in Europe, because they took in all of these immigrants. The females assimilated. The males didn't. Do you think masculinity has to do anything uh, that has to do with the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the the separation strategy? I do, I really do. Okay, females. Let's see how can I explain. Let me let me talk about dogs. I'm not calling humans dogs, but I'm just using them as an example. If we look at a female dog, uh, the female dog. Uh, raises puppies. They stay. The female dog, if there is danger, the female dog will go back to protect her puppies. So what does the male dog do? The male dog goes out and, and attacks whatever is the dangerous. Whatever is dangerous. Female almost always stays around the house. The male dog will go out. He'll range out. Humans are kind of the same way. Females stay home. They, they, feel, they feel, feel like they need to, to uh, protect the home. The males, of course, will go out. Well, I, males join the military and go off and fight a war in another country. The females stay home. I mean, this is the way it was until we expanded the military. <clears throat> as odd as that sounds. So the, the male feelings, the, the female feelings is that she needs to protect her home and she needs to do something to protect her children. And how do you do that? You assimilate. You change, you, you change uh, to, to be part of that culture. I know I talk about movies too much, but if you've ever watched uh, Bend It Like Beckham, which is an, uh, a, a Sikh family living in London, uh, the females uh, are more assimilated than the males are in that movie. The males are try to maintain their heritage culture. They try to be Indian. And it seems like the mother is trying to force her to be Indian, but the reality is she's just trying to make her uh, marriageable, is what she's trying to do. She's trying to make her marriageable. And of course, she's supposed to marry another Indian, as odd as that seems. But we're going to see more of this as we get into, the, into uh, further chapters. They're, they, they're going to talk about this more uh, frequently. And this is separation strategy where they try to maintain their heritage culture, mostly males, and the females, of course, try to assimilate. Because they, they, they're not looking for conflict, and males don't, it doesn't bother them. Conflict doesn't bother them. So sure, they're going to become the terrorists. If we, if we look around the world, you know, who attacked uh, the uh, people in Paris? Uh, who attacked the, uh, the Brits? Uh, you know, they just had a bomb that went off in the subway uh, in England. You know, who did that? Was it some chick? Was she the one that did it? No, it was guys. It was guys from that, the, the host culture. So why aren't the women doing this? We've had one female terrorist in the United States. Remember the, the, the husband and wife that shot up San Bernardino? You don't remember them? They killed 15 people. It was like last summer. It was la last winter. They uh, shot up a Christmas party. She was actually from Afghanistan. He was born in the United States. He went over to Afghanistan and married her and brought her back to the United States. But she's from another culture. And of course, she was... She was uh, uh, made a terrorist over, over in Afghanistan. So she's actually not from the United States. I 
think she wasn't even an American citizen. He was born in the United States, went over to Af Afghanistan, found himself a wife, and brought her back. And of course, she'd already been radicalized. She had been radicalized over in, in Afghanistan. But she's the only female terrorist we have. All, their, all the other terrorists have been males. Of course, all the, almost all the people that shoot people are males. Females don't do that very often. But here we have this one female terrorist. But she, she was from another, another country, and she had never even tried to assimilate to uh, the United States. He was born here, and of course she was able to radicalize him with sex. Did I say that? I said that on tape. <laughs> I don't know how she radicalized him. I'm sure she did it in one way or another. The most common strategy people pursue is integration strategy. <laughs> I know, it's funny. Isn't it? <laughs> the least common strategy is marginalization strategy. It's not very common. Uh, it was re relatively common when we had boarding schools, when we had native board boarding schools. Now, one of the odd things about talking about boarding schools is if you go back east and talk about boarding schools, they think, oh, you must be rich if you went to a boarding school, because only the elite go to boarding schools back east. But of course, you guys were forced to go to boarding schools. And they think of it as, as a privilege to go to a boarding school. So there, there's a little bit of a disconnect going on. If you guys talk about boarding schools and how horrible they were, you know, they're thinking, well, only the wealthy get to go to boarding school. So you know, their, their concept of a boarding school is completely different. A person with, uh, will not strive to fit into the host culture if that culture shows a, a good deal of prejudice toward the individual's own cultural group. And of course, uh, once we uh, uh, started uh, insulting Muslims, uh, that radicalized a lot of males, a lot of, of uh, Muslim males. And the more you reject them, the more likely that they are going to reject the host culture. And that's one of the things that we were talking about uh, when they were, when uh, select individuals were screaming, we need to get rid of all the Muslims. This is one of the reasons why um, uh, uh, Trump's uh, immigration policy uh, is, can potentially create more terrorists in the United States than if he allowed people to come in. Because by, by demonizing Muslims, what he's doing is he's forcing all of these individuals who are Muslim to reject the host culture. That's what he's doing. It's psychology. Does Trump care about psychology? I'm guessing not. <laughs> That's not something he thinks about. It's whether he's radicalizing people. Anyway, this is what psychology tells us. So if, if we were to advise, I, I know you guys have Trump's telephone number and you'll probably call him up tonight. If you have a chance to talk to him about this, you might tell him this. And this is one of the reasons why they've overthrown uh, why the Supreme uh, the, or the uh, the federal appeals courts have overthrown his his uh, his immigration bans because of this. As exciting as that is, uh, blending in. There you go. <laughs> People who have physical features that distinguish them from the majority of, of those in their host culture will likely experience more prejudice than people who have physical features that allow them to blend in with their host culture. For the longest time, uh, people in the United States didn't like people with black hair. Now, what was wrong with black haired people? Why didn't they like black haired people? They didn't like Greeks, they didn't like Italians, they've got black hair. They didn't like Spanish, well actually Spanish have brown hair, but we won't go into that. We won't argue about that, okay. So why didn't they like black haired people? I had a student that was Bulgarian, he had black hair. What's wrong with black haired people? There must be something wrong with them. They hated them. So if you had brown hair, you had blonde hair, you're okay. If you had red hair, you're okay. But if you had black hair, there's something wrong with you. What's wrong with black-haired people? They're Catholic. Italians are Catholic. Portuguese are Catholic. 
Most Eastern Europeans are Catholic. So they didn't like people with black hair. What did that include the Irish though? Mm, they didn't like the Irish either, but they couldn't tell which ones they were. Isn't that sad? They had the red hair. They were the right. redheads. They didn't like redheads. That's why they talk about redheaded stepchildren. And it's an insult. I usually use that, that term a lot. Oh, is that right? Well, you, with, with my previous show. Oh, okay. It's like just treat that item as the okay. red of the stepchild of the family. <laughs> Uh, and it turns out it's racist. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Okay. Actually, there are more Scots that are redheaded than, than Irish, but uh, that's okay. It's still, it's still uh, prejudice. It's still racist, as odd as that seems. So if we can tell somebody just by looking at them, if we can, if we can identify them by some feature, like black hair, then we can reject them. Now, one of the things that happened, and one of the reasons that we started integrating these alien cultures, these Catholic cultures, the United States was fairly Protestant for an extended length of time, until until into the 20th century. But we started accepting them. And uh, any ideas wh why we started accepting these black-haired Catholic people? Any ideas? There was some. There was some other question. I'm sorry. They were similar to Christians. Like no, you're Catholic. It's. Oh, the, that was the same thing. <laughs> that's not the same thing at all. That's horrible. Okay. So what was it? Why did we accept these people? All of a sudden, we started accepting them. Jewish people. I don't know if you've ever been around a Jewish person. Curly hair, curly black hair, dark eyes. But all of a sudden, we started accepting these people more. Before we rejected them. The Ku Klux Klan originally hated uh, Jewish people, they hated Catholics, they hated black people, they hated anybody that was alien to them. They were white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and that's all they liked. But all of a sudden we started uh, accepting these people. We needed them as soldiers during World War I and World War II, and they fought. And they became heroes. And so we started accepting them. Then on television, I mean, before we referred to them as the mafia, you know, we you know, horrible things. We we saw them, Al Capone was Italian, you know, all the all the uh, gangsters were Jewish or Italian, you know, so we so, saw all these negative things in these individuals, but then World War One happened and they had a whole unit of these guys from uh, uh, from the ghettos of, uh, of New York City. They put a whole unit together of these guys. They called them the Rainbow uh, Battalion. And these guys were heroes. They, were, uh, they always put them in front. They were always the first ones to die. Of course, they, what they wanted was for them to fail so that they could show that white Anglo-Saxon Protestants were the best soldiers. But the reality was these guys were really damn good fighters. And they took on the Germans, even though some of them were German. Some of them couldn't speak English, but they could speak German. And they fought like devils. And so they accepted them. World War II, same thing happened. Uh, so during World War II, when we started making films, uh, trying to get the, 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 the country behind the war effort, of course, we always showed African Americans, we showed Italians, we showed Greek, we showed all of these different ethnicities coming together uh, for a common good. You know, and that was part of the propaganda of World War II. So we started accepting these people. And of course, when you're out in a military unit, all of the people in your unit are your buddies. These are your friends because they've got to protect you and you've got to protect them. And of course, some people had uh, not African Americans because the uh, military was still segregated uh, at the beginning of World War II. They didn't integrate until the end of World War II. But in, at the beginning of World War II, they put all these Italians and, and Greeks. And if you watch a war movie from the 1940s that was made during the war, you see the unit as with, with all of these different ethnicities in it. With all these, and usually there was a native in there as well, trying to show that, and they called him chief. They always called him chief. As stupid as that is. 
Anyway, okay, so it was war. It was war that brought everybody together. They needed these people to help fight the war effort, or to, to be part of the war effort. And that's what integrated people into, into the society. So after World War II in the 1950s, you know, the war ended in 1945, in the early 1950s, television started. And uh, of course, now, now we can resegregate because we have television. We can only show white people, we can only show you know, mm -hmm. Protestant people. But what happened was, Walt Disney made a, a television show called The Mickey Mouse Club. And on The Mickey Mouse Club, the most popular person on the, uh, uh, of the group was an Italian, was a lady by the name of Annette Funicello. How Italian, and she had black hair. And you know, all the little boys fell in love with her. All the 11 and 12 year old boys fell in love with her. And after that, nobody even talked about Italians as, as being a select, separate group. But before that, of course, they, these people were, were rejected. And they were rejected because they looked different and because they were Catholic. And now, of course, all of that is forgiven or is forgotten or something. Anyway, okay. So if we can tell the difference between you and somebody else, then potentially there's going to be a prejudice against you. More phys physically distinct ethnic groups are more likely to maintain negative attitudes toward the host culture and p pursue separation or marginalization strategies. For the longest time, of course, all the gangsters were Jewish. Then, uh, then a lot of the gangsters were Italian. And of course, we focused on that. We focused on all of these things. And now, if you watch cops, all the bad guys are what? If you watch cops, all the bad guys are, are one or two groups, two different groups. They're either Hispanic or they're black. And all the, almost all the cops are white on cops, as strange as that may seem. I know. It's resegregating the United States, that one television show. Anyway, so we see all the bad guys as people that are different from us. As, as, as uh, Hispanic or as African American. And that's the way, and that's the way it is. Physically distinct ethnic groups are more likely to actively support collective efforts to benefit uh, their group's uh, social position. People who are of lower socioeconomic status or who are members of indigenous cultural groups are more likely to pursue separation or marginalization strategies because the host uh, culture does not typically offer them much that they desire. Now, I, you know, we can talk about the United States, but things have changed in the United States. Things are, are, are constantly evolving. But we can go over to another country like Iran or Syria or uh, Iraq. And there are groups in those countries that are rejected people. They are ethnic groups. There's a group in Iran uh, that are a different religious group. They're called Zoroastrians. And they are the intelligentsia of Iran. They're not Muslim. It's an older religion than Muslim religion. It's an older religion than Christian religion. They're Zoroastrians or Zarathustras. I knew a guy that was one of these people. <laughs> he was a Zoroastrian. His mother was Iranian. His father was, was uh, in the military, and uh, at that time we had, we had troops in Iran. This was before they kicked us out in 1970, whatever, what was it, 73? Anyway, we had troops over there, and he married an Iranian, which is, isn't something that very often happens. You can't, if you're, Muslims only want to marry other Muslims. If you marry outside the religion, then it's not like, it's not like a, a Presbyterian marrying a Methodist. It's not the same thing. It's, it's, it's taboo. It's, not, it's unheard of. Okay. Um, oh, I have a, a brother and a sister that have married into the Catholic religion. And we don't have any religion in my family. So, But they had to go through different things in order to be, be able to marry this person. As strange as that may seem. Because people aren't supposed to marry outside their religion. Catholics are supposed to marry Catholics, other Catholics. That's just the way it works. And here I have a brother and a sister, and they married into the Catholic, into families that were Catholic. But they had to go through, they had to become Catholic in order to, to marry into the church. 
Anyway, okay. But so if we go to other places, we see that this is, is more distinct. Uh, we see the Druze in, uh, in Israel. The Druze are not Christian, they're not Muslim, it's something in between. It's kind of a mix of the two, the Druze. And these people are rejected people. They have a hard time finding jobs. If you, are, if you live in Iraq and you're a Kurd, they don't like you in Iraq. They see you as something bad. So we can see these rejected people all over the world. And a lot of times it's worse than it is in the United States. If you're African American and you live in the South, it's very difficult for you to find employment. When I was living in Mississippi, and this was in 1990, I got there in 94 and I left in 1997. There were no jobs for African Americans. They didn't hire them. Uh, if they had a, a job as a clerk uh, at a grocery store, they would not hire an African American. And they had a reason for it. The reason was, well, if, if I hire a, a black clerk, then people will stop coming to my store. That was their excuse. So they didn't hire people, if you were. So the, the black people in the South didn't have jobs back then. It was really hard to find work. But of course, in other countries, it's worse. The Kurds, everybody hates the Kurds. And it's one of the reasons why we're having problems in Iraq and, and Syria. The only people that we can get to fight are the Kurds. We can't get the Syrians to fight. We can't get the Iraqis to fight. The only people we can get to fight are the Kurds. But we have to separate the Kurds from everybody else. Because everybody dislikes them. Because they, they're not acceptable people. Their women don't cover. Their women actually fight. But they don't cover. You know, in, in part of Iraq and Afghanistan, or Afghanistan, Iran, and, and Syria, the women wear burqas. They have to keep their heads covered all the time. But the uh, Kurds don't do that. Oh, there wasn't enough water in there. You're so lucky. No, you didn't spill it. Okay. You're okay. Okay. All right. So we're talking about, we can talk about different places where people are, are rejected people. Uh, the extent to which the majority members of the host culture value cultural diversity and tolerance of cultural differences also predicts the amount of prejudice that immigrants experience. Uh, when host cultures promote tolerance for diversity and multiculturalism, migrants are more likely to adopt more positive attitudes toward the host culture, which increases the likelihood that they will pursue integration or assimilation strategies. Now, the only reason I'm telling you about the Kurds is because this is a huge problem that we have. One of our allies uh, are the Turks. So Turkey is, is one of our allies. But they have Kurds also, and they don't like them either. And the Kurds are trying to carve out their own country out of Syria, Iraq, Iraq, Iran, and Turkey. And the Turks don't like it at all. So here we are, we're trying to find anybody that will fight. And the only people we can get to fight are the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga are the, the military arm of the, uh, of the Kurdish people. We've got, we've got this entire population of individuals that are used to combat. And the reason they're used to combat is because they're in constant war with the Syrians, the Iraqis, the Iranians, and the Turks. So right now we're having a lot of trouble getting our allies to accept the people, the only people we can get to fight. And that's the Kurds. So if you were listening to the radio over the summer and finding out that Mosul was being uh, liberated and there's a, some, there's a city up in, in northern uh, Syria that was being uh, liberated. It was being liberated by the Peshmerga, by the Kurds, and the Turks were pissed. We were, they wouldn't let us fly bombing missions out of Turkey. We have air bases in Turkey because they're our allies. They're part of NATO, but they wouldn't let us fly combat missions out of, uh, out of Turkey. One of the reasons that we didn't uh, uh, create a no-fly zone in Syria to keep the Syrian Air Force from bombing all these people was because the Turks wouldn't let us. We didn't have any place to fly out of. We'd, we, we would have to come over from uh, uh, Italy. We'd have to fly all the way over from Italy or from Iraq. 
So we, they'd have to fly all the way from Iraq to Syria in order to maintain a no-fly zone. We couldn't do it. It's too far. It would have cost too much money. As I know money's not important. But I, you know, this is one of the things that we're dealing with when we're talking. When we're talking about ISIS, we're talking about Syria, we're talking about uh, Iran. Right now, uh, uh, Trump is uh, is talking about doing away with that nu nuclear uh, ban on, in Iran. Uh, you know, that, that's what we're talking about. A lot of times it has a lot to do with other things that don't sound like they have anything to do with uh, the countries that we're talking about. But here we are, we're talking about the Kurds. And they are uh, our staunch allies because we've supported them. But the reality is they have no place to go. They have no home country. Kurdistan does not exist. Of course, they want it to exist, but we'll see what happens next. It's a real mess. We've created this horrible, horrible mess because we're supporting one person over another. The acculturation strategy that uh, one adopts might vary across uh, situations. Tur Turkish immigrants in the Netherlands often show an integration strategy in public situations where they act in the mainstream of Dutch ways, yet some will si simultaneously show a separation strategy in private, rejecting the mainstream Dutch ways when they are in an entirely Turkish immigrant setting. And of course, this was done by a couple Dutchmen. If we look at this picture, this is kind of an interesting picture. Uh, all these women are wearing orange, and this lady is draped in the Dutch flag. But two of these individuals are Turks. Do you know which ones are Turks? Can you tell the Turks from the Dutch? Is the one by the flag, the flag and the one next to her? Well, why do you say that? Just a guess. Wait. What color of hair do Turks have? <laughs> you don't? No. What color of hair do, do Dutch people have? I guess, I don't know. Yeah, four of these people are Dutch, and two of them are Turk. The Dutch are the tallest people in the world. As it turns out, they're the tallest people in the world. I thought it was the uh, Swiss. It was the Swiss, now it's the Turk, it's the Dutch. It used to be the Swiss, bastards. So can you tell which ones are Turks now? I still think it's the ones, the ones next, the person next to the flag, the one next to her. Yeah, and they both have black hair. And they also have swarthy skins, darker skins. You can see all these Dutch ladies, fairly pale complexion, almost all yellow heads. This one's got a little, is a little bit of brown. Yeah, those two are, are the Turks. Those two ladies are the Turks. They're shorter, they have smaller features, and they have black hair. Yeah, they're Turks. They're the Turkish people. Turks are kind of interesting people. They, they like to get along with people. But at the same time, they like to maintain their own culture. So when they are out in the Dutch culture, they act Dutch. When they're home alone, they act Turk, Turkish. They maintain their own culture. I found this picture. I was really kind of fascinated. Sorry that you don't know what a Turk looks like. They have black hair. Okay. They're... they're uh, Muslim. You know, the Turks used to control all of the Middle East. That was the Ottoman Empire. They used to control that whole thing. They didn't lose it until World War I. So, you know, all of these relatively, and they're relatively light-skinned compared to other people in the area. Arabs are, are really relatively dark complexion. Not African, not black, but uh, of course they, they have darker skin. Anyway, Turks are fairly light-complected. Complexion, excuse me. And some of them have brown hair, actually. Uh, the four acculturation uh, strategies, assimilation, integration, separation, and marginalization, are hypothesized to yield different outcomes in the acculturation process. The strategy that is hypothesized to, re to result in the lowest degree of acculturative uh, stress is the integration strategy. Uh, the much re and much research shows that this strategy yields the most favorable outcomes. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to integrate you into another culture. And that's the one that works the best. Okay. So once upon a time, we had to decide what to do with American Indians. We didn't want to kill them off. 
So we had to figure out how to integrate them into our culture, into the culture. There are still people in the United States who want to do away with all the reservations and force American Indians into the mainstream culture. They want to do that. One of these guys was Ronald Reagan. Hated reservations. Jimmy Carter built new houses for everybody. Not everybody, of course. He built new houses on, on select reservations. And when Reagan became president, he took away the funding for the plumbing of those houses. I know. So Jimmy Carter built the houses, and Ronald Reagan took away your toilets and your plumbing. <laughs> when Bill Clinton became president, he put, it, he put the plumbing back. But by this time, the houses were already built. You'd already been living in them for, I don't know, 12 years, about 12 years. Actually, he did away with the plumbing, when was it? Like his second year of, of office, his third year of office, bastard. But uh, uh, Bill Clinton put the plumbing in. Of course, they, the houses were already built, so what do you, how, where do you put the plumbing? We have to put it on the outside. So the plumbing, you know. So if you go to select reservations where they built these houses, these HUD houses, the plumbing is, is outside the walls because, you know, you, you don't tear out the wall to put in the plumbing. It was, it's really tough to put in plumbing after, uh, after the, uh, the house is already built. It's a lot easier to do it while you're building the house, right? Put it in the, the foundation and whatnot. Okay. Yeah. Strange. Idiot. Sorry. Trump wants to do away with the uh, reservations as well. But that's no reason not to vote for it. <clears throat> Just kidding. It is a reason not to vote for it. Sometimes, and he may not run again anyway. He may not make it through this term. Sometimes immigrants uh, will adopt the fast food eating habits of Americans. Uh, among immigrants who have lived in the United States for, for less than, than a year, about 8% were obese because of the crappy food that we eat. The KFC, the uh, Burger King, the McDonald's, all that crap, all that fat that you're putting in your body. 8% of them were obese after a year. Among those who had been here for 15 years, 19% uh, were obese, which is almost about is almost the same as native-born Americans. 22% of native-born born Americans are obese. Uh, this is a really serious problem for, for individuals who are relatively short and squat. Of course, some people are tall and slender. They will always be tall and slender. They don't have to worry about being obese. But some people are short and squat. Hispanics tend to be short and squat. Yeah. So this is a real serious problem with Hispanics. And these, these two individuals are actually Hispanic. So this is a real serious problem. It's also a serious problem with select groups of American Indians. Some American Indians are tall and relatively slender, but other American Indians are relatively short and relatively powerfully built, barrel-chested and whatnot. So it's easy for them to maintain uh, stomach fat. And if you maintain stomach fat, what happens next? diabetes. So there's a reservation in this state that has over 80% di diabetic rate. You guys know which, which reservation that is? The Tahano Odom. I'm mispronouncing it terribly. But... Oh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead, pronounce it correctly. I don't know. Tahano Odom. Ta yeah, it's, Odom. it's like they don't pronounce it correctly. I know. I've heard people pronounce it correctly, and I don't. I read it. Okay, I'm reading it in my mind. I don't know what those guys. About 80% uh, di di uh, diabetes. Diabetes rate, uh, mainly because of the fact that they're relatively short and they're relatively barrel-chested. And, of course, that's their body structure when you start throwing uh, uh, Big Macs onto that, that uh, body shape. Then you uh, get obese right around your, your midsection and it causes diabetes. And of course, uh, Hispanics have a lot of native ancestry, short, squat, and so they have a problem as well. When an immigrant or a minority member does not fit the prototype of their host culture, people might question their identity. Is Haley 
for this event. What's her name? Who? That lady. Halle Berry. Halle Berry. Is she black? Is she black? She has straight hair. She has a small nose. Is she African American? She is mixed. Okay, now I thought she was mixed. She is mixed. Okay. So, but a lot of her features are white features. She doesn't look that dark. Her skin isn't that, her complexion isn't that dark. Her hair isn't curly, isn't kinky. Her facial features are small. So a lot of times people misidentify them. So they can live in both worlds. I had a friend when I was in college, he was an African American, but he was a very light complexion African American. And he said, you know, sometimes I can pass. Sometimes people don't really, they think I'm Italian. They, they don't think I'm black. I thought that was fascinating. That happens to me with the same Hispanic, with Hispanic. You, I, yeah, so yeah. I, I dress like a Hispanic or something like that, or right. act like one of them, okay. Sometimes you have to ask them what their culture is. Uh, and this is, uh, and some, if they deny their own identity, of course, this is known as identity <coughs> denial. Uh, or it, it, the fact that people don't recognize who they are. This is James Franco. Do you have any idea what ethnicity James Franco is? Only one lemon say Italian, just a guess. That's close. His father's Portuguese and his mother's Jewish. Oh. I know. Can you tell that by looking at him? That's not James Franco. That's not James Franco? That's James Franco, isn't it? Or is that... Or, is, I actually never mind. I don't know. Isn't it? I have no idea. She's married to a white guy, but he's really tall, I think. He's fairly tall. Halle Berry's husband is white. And, uh, he's Italian, I think. But this, I think that's James Franco. But anyway, James Franco is Portuguese and uh, and Jewish. So does he does he tell everybody he's Jewish? Uh, do people recognize him as being Jewish and Portuguese? Uh, probably not. Identity denial. In 1992, Steele identified a phenomenon that had puzzled psychometricians for decades. What was causing highly qualified African-American students to do worse in their studies? Steele's hypothesis was referred to as stereotype threat, the fear that one might do something that will inadvertently confirm a negative stereotype about one's group. Like the Asian death rate. Exactly. Exactly. So people are afraid that they will embarrass their, their entire race. In the old days, and this wasn't that long ago, people used to say, you're a credit to your race. You're a credit to your race. Well, that, they thought of that, that as a compliment, but of course that put a lot of pressure on that select individual. I was watching a movie the other day, and they were talking about O.J. Simpson. It was like back in the 1970s. And they were saying, well, what a wonderful guy he is. Oh, it was, it was uh, uh, Me, Myself, and I, uh, that new television show. And they were talking about O.J. Simpson. What a wonderful athlete he is. But you know, he's just a really good human being. That's what the other person said. <laughs> of course, that was before all the potentially murdering his, his ex-wife and her boyfriend, robbing people. I don't know. O.J. Simpson just got out of jail. Anyway, stereotype threat. And people used to say that. He was a good African-American. He was a credit to his race. And of course, some people are still saying things like that. Well, he's a he's a he's a good uh, stereotype of, of this select uh, group of individuals. Can all Asians do math well? Well, the only reason they do math well is because they work really, really hard at it. They are not naturally mathematicians. Um, my friend from Bangladesh is a is a is a really good mathematician. Is he a natural? No, he just works his ass off. 
After achieving acculturation, an immigrant uh, becomes bicultural. Uh, the tendency for bicultural people to evince psychological tendencies between those of their two cultures is called blending. And that's what you guys are doing right now. Education in the United States is primarily white. But of course, you're going to Diné College. But we can't just teach you how to be uh, a, a, a Diné that understands psychology. We can't do that. Because psychology, the psychology we have to te teach you is primarily white psychology. A lot of it's Jewish psychology. Freud was Jewish. Erickson was Jewish. A lot of our theories are Jewish theories. Does that mean that they're, they don't fit Protestants and Catholics? No, they fit. They fit. But the, uh, the uh, they were uh, uh, developed looking at a Jewish population, which is a minority population in, the, in Europe. And it's a denigrated population in Europe, if you think about it. The individual tends to switch between different cultural cells in a process known as frame switching or alteration. Alternation. They alternate between one culture and the other. Mm -hmm. So potentially, you guys are doing the same thing. You have to do that. When you're around me, you have to... You can't, you don't speak Navajo around me. You could. I wouldn't understand what you were saying. You can make fun of me if you like. <laughs> Most people do, so it's okay. <laughs> so potentially that's, that's what's going on. You have to blend. You're, you're part of two different cultures. And that's part of the problem with, well, one of the positives about living on the reservation is you can be as Navajo as potentially you want to be. But of course, if you go to Gallup, it ain't going to work. It's just not going to work. You're going to have to blend. You're going to have to, to uh, adhere to uh, the degree of, of, uh, of, of the dominant culture just in order to survive. Just the way it works. Education's the same way. I'm sorry. I wish I, there were some other way to do that. And the whole idea behind Diné College is, of course, that they can teach you your culture, and they can teach things from that perspective. But of course, we can't do that. We can't do that in psychology. We're educating you to go on and get your master's degree, and go on and get your PhD. And if we only teach you, if, if Wilson's the only guy that teaches you psychology, or Avery, then you're not going to have the information you need to uh, be successful at graduate school. So you have to learn this stuff too, whether you are part of that culture or not. But, but of course you probably are. Every time you go to Bosch's, well, I don't know about Bosch's, every time you stop at, at Burger King and order a Big Mac instead of a... <laughs> instead of going to that, uh, that one restaurant that sells mutton sandwiches on uh, on fry bread, which isn't really that native, I guess. You could have that. Or you're eating, you eat chili instead of pasoli or whatever. Ugh. I can't stand mine. I know, I'm so white. It's not my fault. I try to be something else, but I can't. I was talking to somebody about that yesterday. Of course, she's got the same reaction. The reason I don't eat mutton is because I've been around burning human flesh. And the flavor is almost exactly the same. I didn't eat them, okay? I wasn't devouring human flesh. But you get the smell in your... And you can't get rid of it. I mean, it sticks on your clothes. It's nasty. Anyway. <laughs> Try it sometime, Jeff. Go out and kill somebody, and then burn their body, and then stand over the body. And the odors that you get smells like you're cooking mutton. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? Inner city, ch and I can't imagine the Greeks ate this crap. I mean, I'm sorry. They eat, they eat mutton. How could they do that? I mean, the whole culture is based on 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 mutton. You go to a, a Greek restaurant, and everything's 
mutton's the lamb, and no, it's all lamb. Oh, how horrible. And I just can't even stand the smell. But then again, maybe it was, maybe it was the JP4. Maybe it was the jet fuel that I was smelling at the same time. Maybe that was it. Maybe JP4 smells just like mutton. That must be it. It, it ain't the human flesh. It was, a, it was the JP4. Inner city children, especially minorities, quickly learn to discriminate between uh, the norms and, uh, and unwritten rules that govern their schools and mainstream society and those that govern the streets. I told you, I think I told you guys that uh, my daughter is teaching in Clinton, Iowa. Uh, there are a lot of individuals that are moving from Chicago because of the gang violence and all the, the killings in Chicago. They're moving from Chicago to Clinton, which is only about two hours away. Uh, but they're moving to Clinton, and she's starting to have trouble with violence uh, that's very similar to what it, it is in Chicago, uh, in uh, uh, Clinton. Most of these kids uh, in Chicago go to uh, pretty fairly segregated schools. They're community schools. So if it's a black neighborhood, almost everybody at that school is black. That's the way it works. If it's a Catholic neighborhood, almost everybody going to that school is Catholic. Lots of black kids in, in the black schools, lots of Catholics in the Catholic schools, lots of, I don't know, I don't know if they have any Protestants anymore up in Chicago. But my, of course, my, my in-laws are, uh, my, uh, my sister's kids are all Catholic. Why are we talking about this? Because these individuals, uh, when they're in school, uh, they're governed by one set of rules, and when they're out on the streets, they're governed by another set of rules. Code switching is an essential skill for inner city children to learn if they are to survive and succeed in these two di divergent cultural contexts. And you have to survive on the streets. Uh, one of the uh, new things in Chicago, of course we can talk about African Americans and white people if we want, but Chicago has a large Hispanic population as well. And a lot of my students in, at Ashford were Hispanic students from Chicago. And they told me about some of the gang violence that was taking place in Chicago. The African-American kids, they didn't, want, they didn't want to talk about it, but the Hispanic kids did. Because they had only been there for one generation. They had only moved there for one year, but they, the black kids had been there for three and four generations. So as far as they were concerned, this is the way it is. And the Hispanic kids, it was something relatively new for them. And so they wanted to talk about it. So I got, a, I got an earful of what was going on in Chicago. Uh, one more slide and then I'll quit. Anderson in 1999 argues that such children must learn to switch between the code of the decent and the code of the street as they deal with people in their school culture and their street culture. The code of the street permeates many aspects of life, in particular the development of a reputation that one is tough, it is not to be messed with. And that's actually all they want. They don't, they don't want people to, to hurt them. They don't want people to mess with them. They don't want uh, to potentially die from gang violence. Um, I had uh, two students, I'm gonna, okay. I had two students, one of the, and they were of rival gangs. They lived in two different neighborhoods. And these two neighborhoods fought all the time. And they were my students. And they were really good friends at Ashford because they were very similar to one another. But they couldn't go home. They couldn't interact when they went home because one was from one gang and one was from the other gang. And they wore, one wore beige and the other wore brown. Well, beige is a brown collar. <laughs> I know, as stupid as 